Okay. Uh -huh. We're now, I think we're online now. <clears throat> okay, we're now online, buddy. Um, yeah, we can start. Okay, good afternoon, Philippines. Good afternoon, world. Good day. Welcome to another edition of Pinoy Athletics Track Talk Tuesday at uh, Thursdays. Um, with me is Andrew and, of course, our colleagues who are participating all over the world. We would like to appreciate um, your presence for this afternoon. So since we have, I think, the connection went, we're waiting for An Andrew to go back online. Okay, so I hope that you are having a, um, at least a fine situation back home during the Philippines and uh, we wish and that your family are safe from all the risks of COVID-19. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, Andrew, uh, we can start if you're ready, Andrew. If you're ready, we can start soon. So for now, we will share our topic for this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so I'll be sharing now the screen. Uh -huh. But we are now online, so the screen is now sharing for your convenience. <clears throat> there, hello. Uh, the other sorry. No. Sorry, yes, I just sir. had to disconnect just the mobile because um it, w it went onto mobile data and I, I don't I don't want it to use my mobile data so I switched it I switched my mobile data off. Okay, so you're back online yeah. now on your common internet. So now the presentation yeah. is running. So yeah, Coach if you Franz... could change change the uh, presentation to the other one I sent because this is for this one's for later. Okay, so yeah, the other one. Uh, where is the other one? Um, okay, so yes, one moment. Yep. Yeah, the other, the it's a smaller PowerPoint. It's just basically the outline of what's being discussed today. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Because that that coaching philosophy thing will be, um, that'll be used at the end. I think we might. I might go over six o'clock, but you know, but that's fine because. Mm -hmm. uh, the person mm -hmm. coming around, hopefully they're not early. Like if they're more likely to be late, but because they've paid for the yeah. item, they're probably more likely to be early. But um, mm -hmm. I might need to take a quick couple of minute break if someone comes to the door. But mm -hmm. you know, I'm not gonna like if if they start chit chatting, I'm just gonna say um, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I've got to get back to work. So you know, mm -hmm. on a webinar call, so they've got to. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Okay, cool. So today, um, on uh, track uh, talk Q and on Q and A, Pano Athletics Q and A today, we will be discussing the topic of coaching philosophy. Um, here we have a photo of famous uh, basketball coach John Wooden, and 
he quotes here, I'm not a believer in meetings or so-called chalk talks or Blackwood drills. I believe in learning by repetition to the point that everything becomes automatic. Okay, so if I'm relating this back to sprints, yeah, like, for example, you know, um, if basically by continuously doing drills and movements and that sort of thing, they eventually become or you eventually get go into autopilot when you get onto competitions because you've rehearsed mm -hmm. those drills time in, time out, time in mm -hmm. again, and that they became they become natural and you go into autopilot when you get into a competition. Not too much you can do when you go to the meet, you know, but apart from trying to stay as stress free as possible to recall those movements um, and going to autopilot when you're when you're in the zone for a sprint. Now if we could um, move to the next slide. Okay, yeah, so like, I'm not sure this is the best way to put it, but I did rush this, um, this presentation. Uh, yes. No, no, mm. yeah, like somebody just advised that they can't hear the presentation. Um, um, can you, you can hear what I'm saying right now? Yes, I can, I can hear you. I yeah. I'm asking them if they can not hear anything on the Facebook Live or in the Zoom room, just to clarify that. Um, we'll just pause for a few, you know, for probably about a minute or 30 seconds, just to, just to uh, resolve that issue. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't answer that question, then I'll just assume that everything's okay and just proceed. Um, are there any comments? yet on the uh on the facebook live about not um not yet uh, but as of now um, we are joined by at least five people for now david from Dabo university ramil torregosa of Dabo city patrick manalang of San pablo city professor robin darwin toliao of Cagayan uh, state university to city Cagayan province terence yep. o'neill out Outida, um, of course, yeah. he says that he, uh, he can hear. And oh, of so, course, yeah. we have Rodolfo Letty Jr., Sir yeah. Rodolfo, and Landy Fuentes Tilbe of Mandaluyong City on Facebook. So you can continue. So, yes, um, since yesterday, uh, we are, uh, we've been, uh, we've been hearing this news of, um, of the malversation, um, alleged malversation of athletes' allowances by an official of the Philippine Sports Commission. But of course, to, since we believe in due process of law, so we won't mention any until he is proven guilty in the courts. So those Okay, things. we can't, I'm not fully, you know, we can't fully mention the name, but unfortunately, but the thing is the newspapers have already mentioned the name. It's all over, it's, it's everywhere at the moment. So, yeah, so I mean, be better with them so at least yeah, in my opinion once is it's not really relevant that we mention the name of the person it's not you know like because no one will pretty much know who he is anyway so like i think mm -hmm. that we won't mention the name of the clerk or the official that is involved in this you know at the moment the due process is that the nbi is investigating mm -hmm. Uh, investigating this case to see if anybody else is involved because you yeah. know likely it's possible that more people could be involved in this and you know the PSC which is cu currently with officer in charge Commissioner Raymond yeah. Fernandez has agreed to fully cooperate with the MBI and their investigations to basically clean up mm. you know what it clean up Philippine sports whatever needs to be done in order to to, you know, in order to run, be running a clean ship here. So um, it, it's commendable that the PSC is taking this matter seriously and cooperating fully with the NBI to, to find the truth on this uh, particular matter. Um, the amount stated was 14 million pesos, which was allegedly going to the land bank accounts mm -hmm. from athletes that were no longer in coaching. Um, I believe, of course, this is on my humble opinion, buddy. Although, of course, it's already in the investigation bureau details of the of the of the scam. 
I believe that, of course, this is really, in my opinion, only that there's. It's aside from this accused person. Um, I'm I'm thinking as well that there is still um accomplices on this kind of situation because a 15 million fiasco was done only by one person. I'm I'm thinking I perhaps maybe that there is something that um who's involved uh, also involved here okay are you there buddy hello are you there i think uh, okay so uh we have some challenges on the connection so so to continue our so that also okay buddy are you back Uh, you're muted. <clears throat> Are you back? We are having some technical yeah. Sorry, can you just flick back on something to add? Yeah, sure, one moment. Yeah, that past yeah, that... Okay. Yeah, you were back. Okay. I think that if the person, you know, who is being accused is brought, you know, to interrogation by the NBI, then he may, you know, if greased up enough, he may, he may end up dropping, mm -hmm. you know, like spilling the beans or squealing more names if, mm -hmm. if there are more names involved. So I think that, you know, the NBI um, should be more than capable of like, finding out if there are more people involved of course it's possible but you know until the nbi um really mm -hmm. you know come up with like continue their investigation i'm sure we will know in due time okay uh next slide okay one moment But it's good that the management has really tackled that. So it's yeah. good that they're cooperating and doing their best to resolve this issue to clean up uh, Philippine sport. Okay, so the next issue I, I brought up is, um, like I read that from the 15th to the 31st of July, the GCQ will continue, uh, particularly in Manila. And it's very highly likely that if the situation of COVID in terms of cases and deaths gets worse after the 31st of July, then they will be heading into modified ECQ. I think that in modified ECQ, which is a stricter guideline than GCQ, I think that if that would push through and the situation gets any worse, and I think that pretty much most competitions in athletics in the Philippines will be basically a write-off for the year 2020. Um, because obviously, look at the situation. I have athletes I'm coaching over there, and they can't even use the stadiums are still all closed. They can't even, you know, they have to train at home. There's hardly anywhere for them to train. They, even parks and stuff, and you know, like you know, uh, road. Sometimes in some places in the Philippines, the, the police are out roving, making sure people are not even training on the roads. So, in order to have competitions, you know the PTAFA was proposing that they have weekly relays in September in order even to get to the competition stage, the athletes have had to have, have, have to have had time to train first. Imagine it's already the middle of July. It's about six weeks to go before September. And a lot of athletes haven't even been able to train because the stadiums are closed. So how are they going to be able to compete in six weeks if they haven't even been able to train? So that's why I'm thinking that it might be early to have weekly meets in September if like people can't even train right now. So it's sort of like a bit of sort of wishful thinking on, on the part that you're going to be going back into weekly relays in six weeks time when the situation is what it is right now. Uh, do you have anything uh, further to add or should we? Um, I think it, 
um, of course, on my on my thinking, uh, I see that until that the situation hasn't been really um, managed well, for I don't see any event that will come and come on November and December because I think even the uh, yeah. dip ed has to consider and concede the fact that the um, the ASEAN school games in December, which is an international meet, so it involves athletes coming in to the Philippines in November. I think even that is doubtful right now, even though the DepEd is adamant that it will push through still and doesn't have any plans to cancel it. I see it unlikely because, you know, even Vietnam is having competitions right now because it's relatively COVID free. It's not having competitions where it's inviting people in from overseas. This ASEAN School Games in November in Dumaguete is an international meet because you're inviting athletes from the other Southeast Asian countries to join, which puts everybody at great risk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that is as the... The recent news as well is that the, two, that the 2022 Commonwealth uh, or World Youth Games World Youth Olympic Festival, I, I can't remember what exactly it's called, but it's being postponed to 2026. Yeah, I think so. But yeah, um, of course, um, here in, in um, of course, on the context here, um, they already started opening the borders, but um, yeah. there are, for example, in the context of Hungary, they introduced the so-called color-coded system where there is a red country, yellow country and green countries this uh so the red countries meaning if you get out and you came from this red countries you won't be allowed entry if you came from yellow coded countries you can enter hungary yeah. but of course you need to do self-quarantine and to be a uh, subject to um tracing by the state but then if it's right. a green um, green coded country. Um, you can enter freely, but of course, you just I think you just only need to subject yourself to I then um checks or something, something like okay. that. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. Um, in Germany, I think they will have their national championships in August in Braunschweig as scheduled, but I don't know yet the capacity or the crowd. Um, system that they're having because in Austria they're doing now the events but I see that they have only limited audiences and they have only few events um, yeah so it's just only that to continue the season and I and of course it will be at test on August 19 the East Van Memorial which is the international uh, part of the World Athletics Challenge and also part of the World Athletics calendar here in Hungary that it's well announced that they will push to on August 19. So I'll be there and we will see if they will put the um, audience uh, participation on a normal day or they will have some restrictions because here you only wear masks on indoor places like public transportation, bus trains and trams and also entering commercial centers like malls and and stores but of course on open spaces which is of course sports stadium i see people exercising yeah. without any masks and of course the, the disinfection and distancing is implemented yeah. when you're on commercial centers so okay. those things yeah um, that i'm seeing but as far as um it's more on um more on prevention now yeah, but it's still um of course, the risk is there. So I think given the yep. situation, that the, the, the tactic now or the idea now is to the events will push through, but yep. with limited participation with fewer events in order to just continue the season so that the athletes can still have their personal so those things. Yeah, um, but the thing is that countries in Europe are better equipped than the Philippines to to push through with events because of the level of technology and technical officiating in comparison that they're basically able to telecast between three different venues if need be for some of these like diamond league events um that that's the difference in the fact that they're better prepared for the they're better prepared for the COVID already they've already 
like done the modifications and they've already researched what modifications need to be done and they've already come up with well thought plans to to implement athletics in a safe environment mm. while you know we're yet to see that yeah from, some, um, from we're yet yes. to see that place. yes that's right because of course uh, and at least, um, given the situation that there is no open access to sports stadiums um, in the yeah. Philippines right now and even with the federation will try to insist that they will push with the events this year as long as the Philippine government won't say that no no we cannot do this we can do that so it's still really on a limbo where it will so so that's why we yeah, can that's why when we are talking to splash clarification from the IATF yeah, but and, of course, um, as long as they, and, besides, they always change their policy depending yeah, on the situation. But if we go to modify BCQ from GCQ, then the chances of the IAA, of the IATF giving them the th giving sports NSA as the thumbs up is going to decrease because, like in modified ECQ, you have to have even more precautions than in GCQ, right? Because modified ECQ is a higher level of, uh, of. Um, of of curfews and restrictions and GCQ. Yes. Uh, so the, if we go to modified ECQ, the chances of coming back to competitions in September is going to rapidly is going to become even more unlikely. It's going to be rap. It will rapidly decrease the chance of having competitions in six weeks if you go into modified ECQ in two weeks from now. It, it'll, the, the chances of the IATF giving the thumbs up is going to go down. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so yeah. So, like, I mean, we just got to wait and see. I guess it's a it's a waiting game. But the way I see it, it doesn't even look like they're flattening the curve at all. Because if they were flattening the curve, then the hospitals wouldn't be full up. The hospitals are full up. That means the the curve is still very not flat right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so those things, um, that's what I'm seeing right now. So I think it would be very in um, interesting to see how things will happen after July because that's also an acid test. Because, of course, as we know, the cases in the Philippines is continue yeah. rising. And we don't see even, um, yeah. as we mentioned, yeah. flattening the curve. So here... From what I see, very few athletes are actually training right now. Like yeah. maybe only 1% or less of all the athletes. And, and I'm just talking about athletics. I'm not talking about, you know, like swimming, volleyball, basketball, taekwondo, sepak takro, frisbee, you know, like all the all these other sports. I'm talking about just athletics. I think from the way I see it, only 1% or less of athletes are actually training right now because of the restrictions. I mean, people try to go out and train on the roads and sometimes the police come by and tell them to go home. So that's how hard it is to train right now is yeah. the fact that, you know, even if you want to go and do modified training, like it, even just outside the house on the road, you know, do some, some drills or some strides on the road. Sometimes the police will drive past and tell you to go home. Even if you're in a subdivision, you get told to go home, even if nobody is around and you're training and you're wearing a mask and you're taking all the precautions and you're mm -hmm. sort of, and no one else is there for you to catch the COVID off. Still, the, the barangay police will drive past. They'll say, they'll, they'll just tell you to go home, like, because they don't want anyone sort of around, running around mm -hmm. at, at this point. So that's how difficult it is right now, that situation. Uh, anyhow, okay. let's uh, move on to the yeah. next slide. Okay, yeah, one moment. Okay, so this is like Pinoy Athletic stats. So basically, this is a modified version of our motto. So basically, our Philippine Athletics number one news outlet mm -hmm. and news and views. Your Philippines Athletics number one news outlet and news and views for Philippine Athletics. So, yeah, so like, you know, even during COVID, I'd just like to say that we, we are still not letting the fact that it is COVID, like, stop our efforts um, from delivering the news on 
Philippine athletics and Philippine sports and world athletics to some extent, whatever we can find, whatever we have to share, whatever uh, information, knowledge, coaching, advice, um, uh, pep talks, you know, like whatever needs, whatever we can provide, we will provide. Now, what I'm saying, like, so like, yeah, we, we've still continued to grow despite the fact that it's mm -hmm. COVID, what more people are tuning in. So as of now, we have 27,000 followers on our mm -hmm. uh, Facebook page. We have a mailing list of 80,000 and we have nine and a half thousand mm -hmm. or almost 9,600 Facebook group members. So heading towards mm -hmm. that 10,000 mark. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not listing all our other social networks like mm -hmm. Instagram, Twitter, uh, Pinterest, you know, because like I just hadn't had time mm. to compile all that data, but these are our main sources and, you know, like very happy to see how it's going and, you know, how it's grown over the last uh, mm -hmm. eight or so years. And um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. just a culmination of, of the efforts that we've, we've got to this point. Um, yeah. So um, anything to add or should we move on to the next slide? Uh um, we're glad that we are still having the widest reach, and we thank you again, our um, our dear audience, our dear athletics community, for trusting Pinay Athletics for your news and information. Again, as we mentioned, we are here doing this as much as in complementary um, to help one way or another um, to learn more and to have a better community in athletics. As I mentioned. Once all COVID-19 restrictions is over all over the world, in 2021 and 2022, we will have our first series of grassroots athletics visits. Mm -hmm. in, we are seeing three major communities, Don Visayas and Mindanao, that yours truly and someone who we are still looking for a tandem coach um, for this. But of course, we cannot, as given that this is Philippines right now. We cannot really say this, do this. But then one thing, ladies and gentlemen, in August, it will be a better situation for our track talk because we will be inviting more foreign coaches and more resource persons in August. Um, so far, we have still work. We're still working, by the way, with the Palaro people when we'll, when they will be available for to, to answer the questions on all Palaro concerns. But um, I will write them again um, when once they are available. And in August, um, uh, I'll be inviting um, a long jump coach, who is also one of the professors here in the University of Physical Education in Hungary. Uh, his name is Dr. Sandor Beres. Um, he coached in Singapore um, a few years ago, and then and his expertise is in the matters of long jump and uh, biomechanics of long jump. He is a um, master's athlete, um, so it would be good as well to hear his insights, on, especially on how to observe some common mistakes in teaching. So that would be his for August, because here in the context of um, employees here in Hungary, July and August are the paid holiday time. So I think um, because the university is on a summer break, so I can push that much um, people to be invited because they're busy with their personal um, vacations as of this time. But in August, uh, we will be having more speakers. And of course, we cannot also, in, um, I think after, when the German National Championships in Braunschweig in 1st of August will, um, will take place, I think after that, I think we're in a better position now to invite more, especially in September, because September is the first two weeks of September is usually the off-season break for most athletes um, here in Europe before they went again for another season in November, December, until the indoors. Okay. So, I'd like to add. Yes, buddy. Continue. So I'm reading now that how far is our reach? We have 27,000 followers, 8,000, and 
1,500 FB group members. We hope that we can raise it to 10,000 uh, FB group members and we hope to aim 30,000 followers or likers in, in Pinoy Athletics page. And I hope that uh, our friends in mainstream media will really put an appreciation or a what we are doing for Philippine athletics. Of course, uh, we are trying their best to provide them with an in uh, um, as much as possible independent. Of course, as we men, we are not the federation. We are just only doing our best to give uh, public information on related to athletics, coaching, training, and other matters. Adi, do you have something to add before we move to the next slide? You're muted. Buddy, you're muted. I sorry, think you're yeah. mute. Yeah. Unmute yourself. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, like, I keep logging me on and off. But um, what I was saying... Hello? Yes, buddy, continue. Yes, continue. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah what I was saying was in about 20 minutes um, on the Pinoy Athletics.info website, um, it's really... Because my... Um, Every day or every second day at six o'clock uh, mm -hmm. Australian time or four o'clock in the Philippines, I have mm -hmm. a automatic uh, publication uh, scheduled. So the, a lot of interesting mm -hmm. uh, material. Uh, in this case, I had a discussion with an uh, Australian mm -hmm. sprint coach friend of mine, and he basically re we basically are extending on the topic of talent identification. I've got a article mm. which is a situation which he had um which is basically describing talent identification and athlete loyalty to coach which uh is a very interesting read um because mm. you know it's an interesting read how australian some australian athletes have that perspective where even if they're tempted to go to another coach they stick with the same coach who improved them because they know that they're going to continue improving under that um, coach rather than risk going to a coach that may or may not improve them. So that, that's a very yeah, interesting yeah. read and we will discuss that more on Tuesday. But um, just moving on, we, we better uh, proceed to the next slide. So I think that we may run over time here. Yeah, so to continue, ladies and gentlemen, one... <laughs> I think I'm just talking okay. about the training. Yeah, oh, yeah okay. so like this is the next thing. Um, I'm discussing training workouts. So yeah, I'm, I'm helping a couple of athletes online at the moment with coaching. Um, I gave the two athletes uh, two sets of three 200s under the following, um, hang on, I'll just go onto the big screen. My eyes can't really see this on my cell phone. Yeah, so uh, these are this is what I gave them, two sets of three 200s. Um, and these were the conditions that they were done under. So. Yeah, they went at mm. 80 to 85 percent effort um, of their mm. target PB. By target PB, mm. like in this case, I set the time of 23 flat because mm. I think that that's something realistic at this point that they can do. Um, mm. Yeah, and the other important thing about 80 to 85 percent effort is that's that's a comfortable enough. It's like if you think 80 to 85 percent effort in a sprint, that's kind of like a striding type speed. So rolling, it's not jogging, but it's not full out sprinting. That's the sort of speed that you can kind of run relaxed at and focus on your technique and your arms and you know your leg cycles and your running form and running a curve, rounding a curve properly. So yeah, the first thing is do not overexert on the first set. Um, in particular, with this type of workout with with kids they tend to like just go nuts on the first set. And, you know, like say for example, if you've got a girl that runs 30 seconds for the 200 meters, she might run like, I don't know, like 30.5 on the first run, like close to the PB. And then by the time they get to number four, mm -hmm. they can't, they have to, they can't do it. They, they can't finish the workout mm -hmm. because they've already went too fast at the start. So yeah, 80 to 85%. So if that girl's running 30 seconds, 80% of that is about, so 33 is 10%, 90% uh, of 30. So it would be 36 seconds. Mm -hmm. So she has to run 36 seconds if her target you know, mm -hmm. output is about 30. She's got to run 36. But if she's going to 
try if she's running 30 and she's targeting running 29.5 then she's probably going to have to run about 35.5 mm-hmm. on her average time in order to have the conditioning to deload and then to be able mm-hmm. to run that off the time later in the season so mm-hmm. you know two sets of three 200 so you get three minutes mm-hmm. between rest between reps of course mm-hmm. you know you're not going to be able to run full out on three minutes because ATP, the ATP system needs at least five to six minutes to recover properly. So that's why that eight minute rest is really important between the two sets because in the eight minute rest, you know, that that's giving you enough time to mm-hmm. be able to recover and do another quality three, 200 meters, basically think about what you could do better, what, how yes, you continue. Could run better, what form you could use. But, you know, mm-hmm. every second of rest in this workout is needed. Mm-hmm. It's designed to have that much rest. So, you know, you'd make the mistake if you're like, oh, you know, I don't need eight minutes rest. I only need five minutes rest or four minutes rest. <laughs> if you do that, you might not finish the workout or you're going to be really hurting by the time you get to the end of the workout if you do not take every second that is required of this workout. Yes. Yeah, so sk- and one thing by and- one thing. Um, I think this is also also a reminder to our fellow coaches to really consider enough recovery time with your athletes when they're training because don't see um, uh, fatigue as a sign of weakness. Because I'm seeing many some of the coaches that uh, they don't allow their athletes to be because no 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 you know it's not like that late. Allow enough time yeah. for the athlete to recover, especially during yeah. work. Because it's and yeah. besides one thing, don't treat water um dip, or don't treat water deprivation or hide or uh, treat as a punishment for athlete the, not allowing them to drink to do water breaks. I, I don't I, know why anybody would not yeah, allow their athletes to hydrate. I'm sure, buddy, that there are still some coaches who use water um the deprivation or are not allowing of water breaks as a form of punishment yeah but the human body is mainly composed of water it's like 70 to 80 percent of water no you're it's not about ladies and gentlemen you're ruining your the body of your athlete i'm telling you because the majority of human body is dependent on water so if you deprive especially when they are really dehydrated they will really be injured I can um I hope that to those who are listening to us please don't use don't use punishment like um doing water uh, or like doing this kind of sanctions as a form of punishment you can think of positive reinforcements um it's getting better now so please don't use that we are doing this in the past no it's not anymore like that ladies and gentlemen let's continue okay so also with this workout, right, if you're sticking to 80 to 85% pace, you you need, in these workouts, it's very important you stick to the rest intervals that are given to you, which are three minutes between reps and eight minutes between sets. The reason why that is, is because if you take long, let's say, for example, um, like, again, I'll use 30 seconds because that's an easy one to sort of work off. If you've got a girl running 30 seconds for the 200 and she's pacing 36, I mean, 36 is 80 percent of her time, and on three minutes, she should be able to run at 35, 36. Not, you know, stay at that pace. If she rests too long, she's going to be more recovered, and she's going to run like way quicker than what the actual point of the session is, which is to run within those um, comfortable times. I mean, if she rests 10 minutes, she might end up running 32 or 30, you know, 32 and a half or something like that, which is way too much rest, and it kills the purpose of the workout, which is conditioning and um like you know like pace pacing and that sort of thing it's not a workout where you're supposed to be running flat out um so yeah so with in saying that three minutes is actually not enough time to walk back from the start of the 200 meters to the 200 start again so you know if you don't have enough time and you're on a track then you can you start at the 200 meters start and you finish um you finish at the finish line then the next run you start at the 400 start and then you run to the 200 start because there's a stagger so if say for example if you're in lane four and you start at 400 meter start you're going to run to the 200 meter start of lane four not to that line which is near the beginning of lane one because that's not 200 meters that's that'll be 
um, less than 200 meters if you're in lane four and you only run to the lane one stagger. You've got to run to the stagger in whichever lane you're running and to the start of the 200. Um, so that so you don't cheat and run you know less than what you're supposed to and then distort the times. The next thing is yeah, so like this is good on a track oval because it has markings. But you know if the, I'm not sure if this really applicable in the Philippines, but in other countries, a grass track oval is probably better because this is only 80%. So when you're running at 80%, you don't really need to be running on a track. A grass is prob oval is probably better because it's a little bit less strenuous on the feet, a little bit bit less impact on the joints. So grass track ovals better the, a lot of the jamaican athletes train on grass even now um using rubber shoes because like you know if you, the tendency is with athletes if you let them put on spikes they're gonna basically end up they basically gonna push more than 80 to 85 percent a lot of the time but with rubber shoes it's hard to push for 90 to 95 percent at rubber shoes so it sort of keeps them at the pace also, if you train in rubber shoes for reps, when you put on spikes during a competition, since rubber shoes are he a bit heavier and harder to run in, you're going to feel lighter when you put the rub when you put the spikes on during the competition. So it's a sort of a similar form of resistance type training as well, and also more importantly, record the times. So then, therefore, you can track your progress and see, you know, like estimate what you can run the 200 in, and you know, like see, you know, like. If you can track your gradual improvement in the workout. So that's, yeah, that was all on that. So now um, let's move on to the coaching philosophy. I don't know if we'll cover all of it, but I'll try and okay. skip through so it we're, in 20 minutes. We're now moving to the other slide, uh, but yeah. being, yeah, you still have uh, yeah, oops. Yeah, so like, yeah, this is like the last part. So yeah, the two guys I've been working with, they 19 and 17, obviously, these are their times. This is, this is basically how, this is the importance of keeping data in athletics if you're a coach. What's That's important is, yeah, what's it's, important is that, like you can see I've used a nice Excel spreadsheet here. So all, it's very clear on this uh, explanation. I have the age of the athletes, so the 19 and 17 year old guys, 200 PBs, like this is roughly, you know, like I think it might be a bit different, but like, you know, like roughly what they run. and these times here are basically what they're running and they're sticking to their three minute rests. So this is what their target time is 28, 75 and 30. And as you can see with this recovery, all the times are well below the target. And the total is basically, you know, the number, the total, if you add all their times together, what they've run in total, this is what I got from a previous coach who coached me. The total is really crucial as well for data keeping because you can find out and compare the totals each time. And these totals, which are the, to the total amount of time it took to run six repetitions, should decrease mm -hmm. over time as the athlete gets familiar with the set. Yes, and also, buddy, I must say to our dear coaches that even without Excel and you have only just um, manual uh, data, I think it would be very good. And you will. This is a difficult session to do yeah. first. Time. Yeah, yeah they, what I'm saying, buddy, is that, of course, this is the good thing about when you really record the time and the performances of your athlete during training session. It's very easy to do. And then at the same time, it will, it will provide you a greater appreciation on the hard work of your athlete. That's why. Um, as I mentioned, many times, it's always an anecdotal thing for me. When I always ask athletes from even up to Palaro level, even just random, yeah. what is your personal best? Um, I went third in the regional. What is your time? I don't know. And then again, I'm telling this again to our officials and to our coaches in all private and public schools. Please always secure the copy of yep. know the time of your athletes so that you can know if they are progressing or regressing. Okay. Because you cannot appreciate, if, if, if someone cannot appreciate the time and the performance of the athlete, how will you know that they are doing better or they are doing worse? It's not always about the placing because, for example, if it might get the first place of your regional meet, but then the times are not yet Palaro standard or not yet the nat national junior or average yep. near to the junior um junior standings that we, you are publishing in Pina athletics so how can we can aspire to have those kind of um situations 
Because, yeah, um, it's very so those important. Things, that's like, why with, hmm. Data is very important in program planning. It, it's not just important in, you know, like national ranking lists and Southeast Asian ranking lists. And, you know, data is important e that everything's recorded, even the amount of weight that an athlete's lifting, how much rest they're having in between, what intensities yeah, one, they're going at. Yes, one thing, buddy, I will show you, I will show to the public some something that this is how serious the German athletics community is doing the data keeping. Yeah. Uh, okay. Athletic data bank. One moment. Uh. Um, maybe I'll just finish this off first, and then then maybe you can show that next. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll just finish yeah, yeah, this. Sure. Yeah. Okay, continue. Of this. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that, say for example, if your athlete's targeting at a particular time you, by a certain competition, you need to know when that competition is, what the athlete wants to run. Is it realistic? Yes. And if so, you have to do that and work backwards from the competition into your coaching planning. Like for example, let's say for example, the athlete wants to run one minute for the 400 and their best is 105 and they have a year to do it. That's possibly a doable goal. So you need to basically work them off a percentage of one minute for their runs as you go towards the competition with a varying different, you know, with a varying amount of different distances around 400 meters. So in this case, yeah. The okay, buddy. Um, I will show it to them now. Look at uh, maybe after because I'm I'm just still yeah, yeah. finalizing okay. the explanation of this. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Continue. Yeah. So with okay. So with this sheet, we've explained the total. The average time, the average times are basically the if you add all these six times together and divide them by the number of times they ran by six. They've achieved here times of 2703 and 2795. So their targets were 2875 and 30. So in this case, the athlete has gone like 0.8 underneath their target. And in this case, the athlete has gone nearly three seconds under their targets, which means that next time I will probably make their targets, you know, around half a second more because they can manage that pace. So that will enable them to pace better in order to maintain those targets. Now, as, as you can see, yes. Have the athletes achieved their targets? Yes, yes. Now, if these were little kids, I'd probably be, I don't know, buying them an ice cream, some, a packet of bingo biscuits or something for their effort to sort of motivate them a bit. But, um, you know, that maybe they, yeah. Like, so anyway, based on this, and I don't feel that this is entirely accurate, this, these two last two columns, but... You know, if this is 80%, but I estimate by looking at the athletes, they were going at about 82 to 83% or 84%. You know, so the figure will be somewhere between, the estimated time will be somewhere between these two figures. So, um, yeah, so like, I mean, the time, my estimate based on these figures is probably 20 to 8 to 234 if they would put on spikes and go all out, but the, there would be no point doing that right now because, you know, it's not an official competition. It's not recorded. So it doesn't really, it's not really very meaningful if they were to do it now. And, you know, we're mm. still building base. So yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah. So you can present the. Okay. So to say to, to, for the public to appreciate what we are saying about data, uh, data keeping, look at this body. So this is the Light Athletic Data Bank or the German Athletics Data Bank. So for, this is where most or at least all the athlete performance of any German athlete, whether club, regional, federal, and up to national level. I will show something. So Julia. So this one athlete is from Mannheim. Julia, she's a heptathlete. But then you, if you look at this, okay, so that's her name, her age, under 23, and that's her personal best. Right. And to tell, and to, for the public <coughs> attention, when they are doing the records here, all of them are electronically recorded. But here's the thing. This is the thing that I appreciate. Um, their, their electronic timing is like on a van body. It's like it can be transported very easily. So, for example, if there's a competition, for example, in this town, this 
um, electronic timing van will travel there and then do the recording. And so other, so let us see other, okay. other athlete. Yulia. Okay, man. Yeah, you, uh, this one, Yulia. So I'm look. Uh, so this uh, born 2003. So that's her personal best. Okay, always in German. So to, uh, to, uh, to for us to understand. So you can see the personal best, 60 meters, 100. All of the, all of the performances. So. If we can keep this kind of data anytime, anywhere, all over the world, I think we can we can do something for this. But of course, it will take some time because the thing is we don't have yet this centralized system when all performances are automatically recorded. So for example, when you run today, pack, okay, you run, then they will enter the data. It will be centrally network connected to this server and then it will be automatically can I, can I add something here you yes. know like to be honest this sort of planning or implementation has been talked about by the philippine sports um what do you call it the psi for the, yes. the PS the philippine sports institute they've been talking about this for years but i haven't actually seen it being done this, that's what i that's what i'm basically referring to that german thing that you showed me then the psi from the PSC has been talking about doing it for years. And, you know, they've even employed, let me be honest, they, they've employed in the past, you know, like heaps and heaps of people, like, I don't know, like 20, 30 people to do this and nothing's been done. So they've basically employed all these people, but what's actually been done in terms of a database? Yeah, yeah. So, and then, of course, we can also look on the Palaro scan copies, but at least if we can really, if we, if we are really dead serious on do, having the data, etc., any IT professional, I'm sure, can do this. Because, for example, this has been also the subject of a feasibility study of one of the um, I, information technology students. Yeah, of my, my, question is, like, mm -hmm. my question is, why hasn't it been done yet? That's uh, my, my question because they've been talking about doing this for years and it hasn't been done even with IT people and with students and you know like people extra people being hired by the PSI this has not been done it's been talked about for the last four years mm -hmm. I mean the German yeah I'm not disagreeing with it the German the Germans have done it but the Germans like the way they think the way they do things they they're very like the Germans are very rigorous people. They they like basically adhere to deadlines. We've got to do this by then, by this time, and then they just go ahead and do it. It's like the tra it's like the German saying the trains must run on time. You know, like the Germans are very time conscious about when they do things. That when they when they set a deadline to do something, they get it done. Yes, what I'm saying, buddy, is if they're really serious on this, any IT people can do the. The, the, this kind of program in a fairly short time because this is very simple data banking. It's just yeah, only... Yeah, but look, put it this way. The, the, the date, the, uh, the people doing the encoding, right, they need to have some knowledge of the sport. as well. They need to have some knowledge of the sport as well because otherwise the information could be entered in incorrectly if there's no you know if there's no knowledge of the sport in terms of events and that sort of thing as well mm -hmm. so it's not just about being fluent at copying and pasting it's about actually being able to interpret what you're putting in as well to some extent so if someone from was a data encoder from an IT company and they had no knowledge of sport mm -hmm. they could be into, they could be entering in the data inadvertently and correctly because they do, they don't understand the actual um, numbers themselves so they could they could be there could be a lot of typo errors if the if the if the person encoding doesn't have at least some knowledge of sport it's like I'm pretty sure that these people who are encoding in Germany who do the encoding they would have some knowledge of athletics um, but in, 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 in my short that I've noticed, this electronic timing system that they're having is interconnected to the network. And the, so, for example, you run today and then you will have the performance and it on real time. And then I, I think after the event, it will be automatically transferred to this data bank. 
Right. Well, okay, the- I understand that. But my point is that if you're getting people who don't really know about athletics to enter in athletics data, the problem is that they will just copy and paste. And if there's any if there's any errors or anything, you know, that are not right in the original set of results, they won't be able to notice that and they'll just encode it anyway without reporting the errors that are in the original results. It's like, I'll give you an example. Let's just say, for example, in the long jump results, right? In the long jump results, they, the information gets submitted to the encoder mm-hmm. and in the long jump, somebody has jumped 10 meters. The person who looks at the result who's doing the encoding will not say, hang on a minute, that doesn't look right. No one can jump 10 meters. That's the world record. They, they'll mm. basically go, okay, that, that I'll just copy and paste that. And then they'll put it in the original. There'll be no counter checking of results. That's what I'm saying is that if incorrect encode information is given to encode, whereas the, you know, if they don't have knowledge of athletics, they won't pick those things up and they won't report them. And then incorrect information will be given to the public. Yeah, yeah, that would be. So that's why I'm saying I'm pretty sure that the people who are encoding in German athletics, because for sure in athletics in Australia, they have some knowledge of like actual uh, sport results. They don't just hire people who are from IT companies who don't know anything about sport to do the encoding because they won't be able to counter check any errors. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I'm saying that it's a good thing. Those, the German system of having those results, that's all good. It's just I'm, what I'm just saying is that um, you need to have someone who knows, who can actually counter check incorrect information, who has a little bit of you know, athletic background to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, mm, so those things, yeah. So, yeah, what I'm saying, just only. Op- that it is a different situation. No, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we have different socioeconomic situations, of course, here in EU. But the thing is, if we are really dead serious on making sure that we, we, that we can work something on this, now, then at least we should try. Um, we are just saying that this is a good model. But of course, it, it still depends on, on, on those kind of situations. Yes, buddy? What I was saying is the really- the reason why I think that the PSI's plan to make a national database never really pushed off was because they basically tried to hire students who had knowledge of IT, but not really. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, continue, buddy. Yes, yes, continue. I think you're, we are having some trouble with the connection. Okay, we continue. Uh huh. Um, Ardell. Uh, we have technical difficulties with the connection, so please bear with us. Of course. Um, yeah, we can wrap this up and then we will continue anytime soon. Uh, for our discussions. Okay, we will do some shout outs once you're ready, but
continue with the chat. Um, again, before you continue, we'd like to thank again our participants on Facebook. Uh -huh. um, Randy, G, and Albert, Justine, of course, the one and only Marco Vilog. Um, I'm a Kabalan Jr. of Kalinga Province. Uh, the illustrious Marco Vilog. <laughs> or the the Vilog ang mundo, Vilog ang mundo. The world is round with Marco Vilog, the one and only Marco Vilog. And then Patrick Manala, Professor Robin Darwin Toliao of Cagayan State University, Tugagalaw City, one of our dear friends in. in Actually, region. like to be honest, like uh, with a. Uh, like on the on that on that note, it would actually be very interesting to hear from someone um, who, you know, like who who has a really good uh, qualification, like Robin in sports science. It would actually yeah. be good to hear his views on training and um, yeah. programming and that sort of thing. I, I'm I'm very happy that he that he tuned in, and I, I really respect the guy. Um, you know, he's yeah. a more coach who who really appreciates the planning and uh, sports science uh, type of thing and he's you know he's well read with a lot of peer-reviewed type studies and materials yeah. and that. so he, he's a very intelligent sort of coach so he'd be a good one to sort of you know discuss uh, these sort of things further with um, anyway yeah. continue Bob. yes okay so we hope that um, yeah um, so yeah we hope that um we continue our discussion for the next uh, edition of the track talk um of course we will have part two next tuesday on the coaching philosophy um for another session so for august it will be jam pack uh, sessions for our guest speaker yeah. As I mentioned, we have set roster of um, international speakers coming in, so stay tuned uh, to us every Tuesdays and Thursdays. Make it a habit, um, 4 to 6 p.m. or 4 p.m. Philippine time. Uh, sorry, 2 to 4 p.m. Philippine time. Yeah. So with that, we end our discussion and our track talk here at Pinoy Athletics. So thank you very much for participating and take care and God bless.